Um, you know, it's really an honor to come uh, speak uh, to you all today, and and thanks a lot for joining. Um, particularly given all the you know crazy stuff that's been going on in the world lately, I hope all your you, your family, and your friends are safe uh, and healthy. To start, let me just mention uh, up front that this topic is is uh, on a challenging and often emotionally exhausting topic. Uh, we'll be discussing abuse, physical and sexual violence, harassment, um, etc. So, you know, please take care of yourselves. Uh, and feel free to turn it off or, or take a break uh, in the middle of the talk. With that, let me just start by providing some brief background on intimate partner violence, which is just uh, a really gigantic, you know, social ill. A relatively recent survey run by the CDC uh, in the US indicates that about one out of four women and more than one out of 10 men will at some point in their lives suffer from physical violence, rape, and or stalking by their husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, or other form of intimate partner. Historically, IPV has fallen under the term domestic violence, and often the terms end up being used sort of interchangeably. But over time, there's been an increasing realization uh, that the traditional focus on kind of heteronormative husband-wife relationships in the home and physical violence uh, doesn't aptly characterize the behave pattern of controlling behavior by an abuser uh, to establish power and control over their partner. You know, this can include intrusive monitoring of partner, threats of violence, demands about how they dress, isolation tactics such as controlling who they socialize with, repeated put down, sexual coercion, and, and so much more. And survivors really routinely report that such abuse uh, is, uh, you know, can be even more painful and debilitating than, than physical violence. So ultimately, abuse is about power and control of the victim. And so for me as a technologist, it begs the question of what role technology plays in intimate partner violence. You know, as we become increasingly reliant on technology in our lives, it's probably no surprise that uh, technology has become a lever uh, abusers can exploit to uh, exert control over their partners. And indeed, uh, earlier research, you know, has documented a, a host of ways in which technology gets exploited. Uh, I think these excellent papers raised, like, like all good research, raised a lot more questions than they answered. So I had personally been long interested in this topic, not only because of you know, the human cost associated with IPV, but also because I wanted to understand how our computer security tools work in the presence of abuse by an intimate partner who knows the victim really well, may have physical access to them and their computing devices, and is highly motivated. So I was really fortunate and lucky that uh, when I joined Cornell back in like 2015, Professor Nikki Dell uh, joined at the same time, and we realized we had a mutual interest in the space and kind of very complementary uh, research uh, backgrounds. And so this led us to kicking off a collaboration aimed at studying technology and intimate partner violence. This snowballed over the past, you know, almost six years now and culminated in us launching a couple of years ago, uh, an organization called the Clinic to End Tech Abuse uh, that we run at uh, Cornell Tech. And it combines direct, you know, survivor interventions with basic research and legal advocacy uh, and more and what, I like to refer to kind of as an advocate scientist type model, which is uh, something I'll return to at the end of the talk if we have time. So what I was gonna focus on most of the talk is our research that kind of uh, started with trying to understand the landscape of technology abuse and intimate partner violence via qualitative studies uh, done in the New York City area. And then uh, where we kind of started under trying to understand the types of resources available to abusers uh, via online measurement studies and investigation of tools like spyware apps that uh, were talked about a lot by survivors and support professionals. And then led us to our development of like interventional models for providing support uh, to survivors. So we've been really fortunate to uh, be able to partner with the New York City Mayor's Office to end domestic and gender-based violence. This is the municipal government organization that's tasked with uh, survivor support. Um, and they in particular run a set of family justice centers, which are these really nice one-stop shops for survivors who are in this context called clients uh, because of the clients of the family justice centers where they can come and, and get uh, access to just a range of services all in the same location, uh, mental health uh, support, uh, police, district attorneys, uh, you know, uh, shelter, uh, uh, routing to shelters and, and all that type of stuff. Uh, and, you know, being New York City, the scale is quite big. I think uh, in 2019, they had about 64,000 clients. 
visits to a, a family justice center. And you know, this is probably just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the number of people in New York City alone that uh, really could benefit from support. So I said we were able to do uh, a study in collaboration uh, with the uh, NGBV. And we designed a uh, protocol where we, one, did semi-structured interviews with uh, 50 professionals, which are like case managers, social workers, police officers, and others. And we're also able to do focus groups with uh, uh, a large number of survivors. Uh, and at the time, this was you know, the largest, and it's actually still to this date, the most largest and most demographically diverse kind of qualitative study in this space. Uh, and really allowed us to get a sense of the landscape of what was going on in terms of technology uh, in IPD. It was really inspiring and continues to be inspiring uh, talking to uh, survivors. You know, they're very strong and many of them are very uh, excited to share their stories with us uh, in order, uh, in the hopes that it was gonna help us understand how to improve uh, you know, outcomes in this space. So with that in mind, I'm going to read a, a client story uh, or a subset of a client story to give you a feel for the types of things we hear in the field. Um, we've taken precautions to preserve anonymity of participants, so the wording has been changed a little bit, but really tried to ensure that these quotes, uh, the quote still captures the voice of uh, our, the participant. I was raised in a country in which women are trained to serve men. I'll say that he never hit me, basically, but he did the worst thing ever. Honestly, I would probably rather that he hit me instead of the things that he did to me. He put spyware in our computer. Obviously, I didn't know because he studied computer programming, so he was very savvy about it. He went into my computer. He got my Facebook password, email password, and he shared naked pictures of me. He sent them from his Facebook to my bosses. He took my phone and he sent them through private messages to several friends, but also through my email and my Facebook because he had the password. The embarrassment that I went through, the public humiliation, it beat me to the ground. So stories are quite heavy uh, and involve, you know, when we asked about technology abuse, we would often hear uh, of just a litany of ways in which uh, technology was being uh, weaponized really against uh, the survivor. Uh, so here we see installed, you know, owner, using shared ownership over device to install spyware, uh, account compromise, uh, non-consensual intimate images being shared of the, the survivor, device compromise, impersonation, uh, but, you know, using uh, an account that the abuser had access to. And while not all uh, stories were is involved, a lot of them were actually, uh, there was very multimodal in terms of the types of attacks, uh, technology attacks that uh, we heard about. So we did a bit of uh, taxonomizing to try and understand the range of, of issues and came up with kind of a, at a high level, four categories of, of problems. One is what we refer to as ownership based. And this arises because in IPV, most often the abuser owns a device or account, maybe set up uh, these devices and configured them. And this kind of trivially gives them access to the technology that the survivor is using. Otherwise, the uh, abuser may be able to compromise uh, accounts or devices by either just knowing shared passwords or being able to predict them or having physical access to a device and unlocking it. Some other uh, harms uh, didn't involve access to devices or accounts, but were more about like harassment online. So messages or posts um, on social media, um, threats of, of violence, you know, being sharing pictures of guns or whatnot to uh, clients. And then finally, like the non-consensual intimate imagery in that story, the uh, uh, use of, of exposure of private information as a threat or as a, a punitive measure uh, against the, the, the survivor. And so again, we saw in that one story, a bunch of examples. In fact, this, the, the, the client's account went on much longer and there are many other issues that, uh, that they had faced as well. So this raised a host of questions for us. One being, you know, why aren't our security mechanisms working really well for uh, survivors in these IPD contexts? In my view as a computer security uh, researcher is that you know, many of these IPV threats just are not really being well addressed by our security mechanisms. Um, and that's because of, of issues with threat models. So one thing I'll say is we hear all the time about how uh, abusers are hacking into accounts or hacking into phones. And when I hear hacking, of course, I think of you know, what I learned in computer security classes in undergrad, I mean, it's like 
software exploits, SQL injection, or privilege escalation vulnerabilities, right? Because recently with the news about uh, nation state level spyware uh, and uh, exploit operations like Pegasus. But this is definitely not what we're hearing about and uh, seeing um, uh, from what survivors told us. Um, and instead, you know, the, the threats are most often not very technically sophisticated, uh, but they succeed because there's this mismatch in threat models versus threats, right? So as we know, threat models, you know, specify who are the attacker victim and, you know, what the attacker's capabilities and goals are. And if we think of something as simple as, and well, why they use as passwords, I'd say that the conventional kind of threat model about this is that an attacker is some stranger on the internet, you know, who may be, say, pers uh, commercially motivated to compromise an account, but they don't know the victim personally. They connect from some other place on the internet. But in IPV, this is not what's going on, right? The attacker is the, you know, an intimate partner or former intimate partner who really knows this victim very personally, can guess or maybe even compelled through threat, you know, disclosure of passwords, uh, may be using the same devices or at least be in the same uh, network as, as the, uh, as the uh, legitimate user. And so this makes it that the mechanism just isn't uh, working as well. And there's lots of other examples. Uh, you know, we hear a lot about fake accounts being set up by abusers and, you know, to the uh, support workers uh, or survivor, this is very obviously the abuser, but, you know, the social media companies would have no way to verify this or detection of abusive content. I mentioned like, you know, sending threatening uh, images, say sharing threatening images on social media, like a picture of a gun, you know, in the context of an instant power violence situation, this is quite threatening, but may, not violate policies or rules online. And I'll say that, you know, most of the attacks that we heard about are what fall into what we call this UI bound adversarial model, which just means that, you know, you know, the abuser is exploiting standard user interfaces. They're not using any specialized tools even. Uh, and that's probably the majority of the types of attacks that we saw. And I think this is a useful model for thinking about how we can uh, uh, structure uh, interventions because the user interface really is, you know, the, the barrier, the boundary of which many abusers are operating. Okay, so this initial qualitative study really gave us a broad sense of all the issues that uh, survivors were facing. And this led us to start under trying to think about how we could structure uh, improvements in this space. And so the first step for this was trying to study how abusers are uh, uh, operating and the types of resources that are available to them uh, and that support kind of them in their abuse. And uh, it turns out that there's just actually a whole wealth of, of resources for abusers online, but actually much more in terms of uh, resources than for survivors or, or potential victims. And so if you go Google for something like how to spy on my husband, I just did this you know, last night, uh, it actually pops up a <laughs> Google a helpful uh, a helpful box, which kind of in, taken from some article about ways you can spy on, you know, covertly spy on your um, husband. And uh, indeed, this is just tip of the iceberg. You know, there's like online forums discussing this. There's uh, YouTube videos, mainstream media articles, um, you know, advertisements for hack for hire type services, etc. You may ask why. Um, I mean, I, I guess there's a lot of demand for these things, unfortunately. And also many of these are little cottage industries where people are making money off of abuse, right? The uh, spyware or what's often called stalkerware apps kind of ecosystem is a bit of a cottage industry of developers providing these um, uh, apps to monitor people and they make money off of it from abusers. And same with uh, YouTube and otherwise. So the, you know, we wanted to dug deeper and we also realized this presents a nice opportunity for uh, online measurement studies to try and get a better sense of what these resources are like. And I'll just talk about, you know, kind of two efforts here. One is on investigating online forums and the other is investigating the spyware app ecosystem. So uh, it turns out that um, there's a lot of forums out there, uh, many of which focus on infidelity uh, and like helping people kind of uh, navigate their perceived or real infidelity issues in their relationships. Um, and this provides a ready public uh, data set. Uh, well, once we built a crawler to uh, crawl these uh, forums and, and, and download posts, um, it provides a 
pretty big data set uh, provided that gives us insight into uh, some of the things that people are discussing online vis-a-vis -vis intimate partner uh, uh, abuse. So we, um, after gathering this large data set, we did a mixture of like quantitative and qualitative analysis to understand the content here. Uh, tech abuse discussions were pretty prominent in the data set. Not all threads and were related to technology abuse, but about 20% of them had some discussion of, of particularly like intimate partner surveillance tactics that involve technology. Um, and this provides, you know, a source of actual like threat intelligence for uh, abuse tactics. Um, and we saw this kind of complementary viewpoint from what we were hearing from survivors. We saw from these posts um, online, you know, the same types of um, uh, abuse tactics that we heard about from survivors. Uh, in addition, you know, uh, we were, the richness of the stories that people were sharing, and it's really amazing how much detail people go into, you know, gave us the ability to apply some deeper analyses to try to characterize the experience uh, uh, and mindset of abusers. And so using a grounded theory methodology, we were able to use the data set to drive a framework that we believe models the progression of IPV tech abuse um, uh, uh, for, uh, you know, would be uh, or future abusers. And so our four stage model, uh, it includes, uh, starts with basically kind of the background of, of expectation setting um, for the uh, person, you know, and their expectations about what is appropriate in a relationship. For example, we saw a lot of stories, people having, expressing the perception that, you know, they should have access to their partner's devices and be able to monitor their accounts online. That's just part of what being in a relationship is about. And then many of these stories then change. There's a change in attitude or thinking where the uh, person basically becomes suspicious of, of, the, uh, of their partner. Uh, this also interestingly often coincides with increasingly derogatory language about the victim in the stories and leads the uh, person to brainstorm about and seek out uh, abuse strategies. Um, and then you know, they may escalate then to actually doing things like the partner surveillance or other forms of abuse. And this may then kind of iterate in multiple cycles. Interestingly, many, in many stories, the initial lack of evidence for say infidelity was often taken as a sign uh, to the abuser that they should you know, redouble their efforts and look harder because they were absolutely convinced that they would find something. Uh, eventually, uh, the stories also include a reflection often about uh, that the abuser um, you know, reflects on what they did and they often frame themselves as the victim uh, in these situations, which is very consistent with other kind of uh, discussions of uh, abuse. And this is just, you know, maybe in one relationship, but you can imagine uh, that it makes sense that people's experiences with abuse as abusers also impacts uh, future relationships as well. So another interesting point in our model is that, you know, there's clear influences on progression from across these stages. And these kind of uh, assert are like red flags that more that the abuser is going to continue on further in the model. And so these particularly provide us with potential ideas for uh, interventions, you know, with would-be abusers. And one thing that really stuck out to me as a computer security person is that, you know, often the ability to get access to spy or other tools um, or, you know, technical capacity to surveil via, you know, uh, account compromise or this type of thing was a clear, uh, uh, a clear uh, hurdle that uh, abusers often had to get, get across uh, as they tried to escalate to abuse. So this was consistent also with what we heard from on the survivor side that uh, survivors were really concerned about uh, things like spyware, which are also, as I mentioned, referred to as stalkerware. Indeed, we heard stories about how abuser would stick apps on devices uh, to do location tracking or other monitoring. And as I mentioned, there's a cottage industry of these types of apps uh, online. They, in the worst case, particularly for Android, they provide pretty invasive um, capabilities in terms of monitoring uh, location, also text messages, you know, some data from other apps on the phone, et cetera. 
So we wanted to study this uh, and actually study this uh, a few years ago, we started doing measurement studies to try and understand you know, the prevalence of IPV relevant apps and like what the scope of these tools are in terms of how they uh, work for abusers. So it turns out you can use search engine recommendations. So if you go to like the Play Store, at least if you did back in 2017, because uh, Google changed some of the stuff in response to our study, you can you know type in track girlfriend and it'll provide a bunch of suggestions for other searches people use. And so we did that to gather a whole bunch of uh, potential searches, found lots and lots and lots of apps that hit on those searches, used some lightweight machine learning to kind of filter out uh, clear false positives, and then did some manual review to assess the uh, uh, what apps may be usable for IPV. Uh, we did a much smaller study on the iTunes App Store and also found uh, some apps. Now these numbers are very large. Uh, and the reason is that in addition to those kind of over malicious uh, spyware apps like the pictures I showed in the last slide, there's a lot of what we refer to as uh, dual use apps that you know, may have legitimate purposes but can have repurposed for spyware. And so um, if you go look at forums online actually about spyware, you'll often see things where people are requesting information about uh, how to, what type of apps to use and you'll get recommendations in this case for an app called Cerberus, for example. At the time uh, of our study, this was indeed a, an anti-theft app that was available on the Google Play Store, the official Play Store, uh, and it had lots of features that are uh, useful to abusers. Uh, we made, it was at the time able to be covert, you know, you can record audio, take pictures remotely, et cetera. And so this is what we refer to as a dual use app. You know, it's designed for say theft or anti-theft, but uh, is repurposed easily and has the features for uh, spyware. So we've made some progress on addressing uh, IPv spyware. I mean, I, spyware is this you know, thing that I thought we understood very well because it's kind of like uh, malware, other forms of malware, and we have tooling for that. Uh, Google definitely took down a bunch of apps and content and changed how they did search um, for, uh, to try and uh, not surface these types of uh, abuse type searches. And we've also been doing some work with antivirus companies to try to, uh, uh, to get them to uh, start flagging these types of apps uh, so that if a survivor installs their AV product, it'll at least catch some of the more egregious um, spyware. Um, and definitely a bunch of the, uh, the, the uh, AV vendors have started doing this. And there's now this coalition against Stalkerware that was put together by the EFF and some companies to uh, try to address this issue. Uh, there's lots of work to do. Um, you know, we did some research that's actually appearing this week uh, on how customer support uh, handles IPV situations at AV companies, because it's often a place that um, survivors go to to try and get help. Uh, and there's lots more to do beyond that. Most of these, uh, in fact, none of the apps, the AV apps that we know uh, that flag most dual use apps. So this is still a kind of gap between the uh, what survivors kind of need and what uh, 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 AV is providing right now. Um, so yeah, there's lots, lots more work to do. Um, more broadly, you know, spyware is something that gets talked about a lot. It's very tangible. It's very scary sounding um, and, and is scary uh, if it was uh, employed against you. But remember that most of the things that we heard about don't involve even access to tools, even like commodity, commoditized tools like uh, IPv spyware. And moreover, each individual situation uh, a, a survivor may be in is, is quite complicated. And so how we, you know, I think it would be naive to think we can just uh, have a technologically, uh, a technology only solution to this type, to supporting survivors. Um, and we won't be able to like fix all the various technologies in ways that they can't be abused, right? And so what we need is um, socio-technical solutions uh, in particular, this led us to start to think about how to design interventions to directly support survivors who are you know, suffering from technology abuse. So back to the New York City Family Justice Centers, which is the uh, New York City's um, support centers for uh, IPV uh, survivors. What happens uh, in these uh, centers is that a client, so the survivor, you know, may get referred due to a domestic violence, you know, police call or from the hospital, or they can just walk in. 
they get routed via a case manager uh, to various uh, resources, right? If you come in and you need help with uh, housing, then you get sent to the housing uh, specialties or mental health or legal or uh, education, et cetera. And this is a really fantastic model for, for getting uh, support. Um, in our initial studies, when we did these uh, interviews with professionals, it was, became, uh, became obvious very quickly that there was no best practices for evaluating technology risks in this ecosystem. There's no screening for technology abuse or checking uh, phones. It was all very ad hoc. Uh, and basically, support professionals would kind of learn on the job you know, as they encountered individual situations with clients. Um, how to try to help them navigate uh, technology issues. Overwhelmingly, both you know, victims and the professionals helping them uh, reported having insufficient kind of technology knowledge for, uh, for actually helping with technology abuse. Um, and it's not surprising, we didn't meet anyone with a you know, formal technology background uh, in the you know, 50 professionals we met. And there's lawyers, there were, uh, social workers, uh, many other professions, but not a lot of people from the technology sector. And definitely one of the things that we heard early on was that, you know, what would, we asked explicitly, what would be the you know, number one thing you would at, want us to try to do to improve the situation? And people said uh, routinely that, you know, getting more technologists involved in this space would probably be a big help. And so this led us to this idea that really, you know, there's a missing node in this ecosystem of support, and we should be providing uh, resources as well for technology issues and computer security more broadly for clients. And this led us to this idea of what we started calling clinical computer security. You know, the idea that we would uh, come up with models for training and uh, deploying, you know, technology consultants uh, who both understand technology computer security and tech abuse, but also have some background training on how to interact with uh, survivors. And uh, then they would be, there to, as a resource that clients could get referred to uh, to help them with their technology issues. So in 2018, we spent months and months and months, you know, kind of carefully designing procedures for how to deploy uh, initial interventional model. Um, involved, you know, I think it was like nine focus groups, maybe maybe 14. It was a lot of focus groups. I have to go back to the paper uh, with professionals, kind of getting their feedback on what we were planning on doing and iterating on our designs. And then once we felt it was uh, pretty consistent with what professionals were telling us in terms of our models, and uh, we went and got approval to do an initial field study with uh, clients. We had, as part of our procedures, we would you know not just talk to the client about their issues uh, it, very broadly, but also we built a specialized spyware scanning uh, tool for uh, that you can connect over USB to devices to try and flag some of this type of spyware that we'll be seeing. So we um, deployed this in 2018. We did an initial field study with 44 clients, scanned you know 100 devices or uh, sorry 75 devices. The instance rate of spyware was, was very low. Uh, we only found a few that had potential kind of spyware uh, issues. And, and, um, but we did find lots of uh, examples of like account compromise. In fact, our takeaway is that actually most of the time uh, abusers get most of what they want in terms of monitoring control by just uh, uh, compromising uh, client accounts like uh, Gmail accounts or Facebook accounts or, or iCloud accounts. We're also able to reassure many clients about lack of, of tech problems. So the uh, NGBV leadership was really excited about the initial results. You know, most, not, not all the survivors, some survivors, of course, were frustrated. They had very complicated situations, but the majority of survivors were quite uh, thankful uh, and positive about their experience with it. And so this led us to set up what we call the, what we started calling the clinic to end tech abuse, um, which is basically a direct service provider now in the New York City area for uh, clients. We work through the NGBV. We've served hundreds of clients. You know, we have dozens of volunteers now. Um, Pre-COVID, we met in person on site at Family Just Centers. Now we're doing remote uh, consultations. So we go do checks over the phone. There's a paper, we had a paper at Kai this year documenting the kind of challenges of, of transitioning this whole service to um, the realities of, of uh, of, uh, of having to do things remote. 
Um, we also do some trainings for IPV support professionals. Uh, there's also something that's quite high demands like training the support professionals about technology issues hope, hope, with the hope that they'll be able to help uh, people directly not have to refer them out to a specialized uh, computer security service. And uh, there's been a lot of work on legal advocacy, particularly uh, uh, from our former director, Sarah St. Vincent, who has a law background, and then uh, Thomas Codry at University of Georgia, um, uh, really pushed on uh, advocacy on the legal front. And we have the Safe Connections Act, which is being discussed in the US Senate right now for trying to push through some legislation to get cell phone companies to make it easier for survivors to uh, get out of uh, shared accounts with their abusers. So overall, there's a lot, I think, to do still in uh, technology abuse and intimate partner violence. You know, we really do need to rethink how we design technology. You know, as I mentioned a lot about like user inter or I mentioned UI bound adversaries, but I didn't talk a lot about UI design. I think there's a lot of interesting questions there about how we can improve uh, or, or make harder uh, the abusability of, of features. And we need more thinking about that. Uh, we do need to you know, reimagine and think a lot about socio-technical systems uh, in terms of interventions, both survivors as well as with abusers, right? Like, I think there's a lot of opportunity to improve our understanding of, of how to intervene with abusers to prevent problems from happening in the first place. Um, and definitely there's policy and legal stuff that needs to happen. So there's a lot of great work to do. And I think it's really important that this you know, is done carefully. We, tried very hard in our work to kind of run things by professionals who are experts in this area, also talk to survivors who are experts on their situation. And to me, it's been very exciting to try to build this kind of mixed advocacy and research model uh, embodied by uh, the Clinic 10 tech abuse uh, so that we can continue this type of work in a way that's very well informed by you know, issues um, uh, as, as they're faced by survivors and the professionals helping them. And in more general, I like to refer to this as kind of advocate scientist model where, uh, you know, researchers aren't just academics, but uh, also advocates for a particular uh, specific population, both in the kind of big advocacy sense of like advocating at a systemat systematic, systemic level for change, but also directly supporting individual uh, people. And I think this is a really beneficial model. It has been for IPV because, you know, really, uh, improves understanding of the situation, right? It surfaces all sorts of subtleties in terms of threat models. Uh, super critically, it, it mitigates uh, much better risks of harm and exploitation. You know, it's very seductive to get into this idea of, oh, we're going to solve things by throwing technology at the problem. And then when you talk to professionals, you're like, no, that's not going to work very well. And that could actually be harmful for, for survivors. So there's uh, you know, being engaged and in, in deeply embedded in these communities uh, is helpful for mitigating these types of risks. And of course, there's the fact that you can have immediate impact both on individual people's lives and, and more broadly, uh, which can be really gratifying. On the flip side, you know, doing this type of work is really hard uh, in various ways, right? There's a lot of invisible labor, which maybe to people who do uh, more human facing work than I did before this, this type of research uh, was clear in terms of partnerships. Also, in this topic, there's a lot of emotional labor involved, um, for sure. And I think more st structurally, as a research community, I don't know if we really have great models in the computer security community for like how to do these kind of blended uh, advocacy and, and science kind of approaches. Um, if you go look at like the medical uh, field, for example, they have the medical scientist training program, which is like you get a PhD and an MD, and it's very explicitly set up to be supportive of translational uh, research. Um, and, you know, also I, one thing we get a lot of pushback on, I'd say sometimes from research communities, like the pressure to generalize, like, oh, you know, we are studying IPV, but maybe you should be looking at other stuff as well, which to me is a bit fraught because, uh, you know, I think you need to be very focused on particular user specific populations in order to address their needs well. And if you overgeneralize, sometimes things get, some of the nuance gets lost uh, in potentially dangerous ways. So anyway, this is just, you know, I guess a question to the research community as well, which is, you know, how can we, I, I think this type of uh, work is really important, uh, but it's very, you know, it, it's hard. We were kind of lucky that we had the right ingredients at Cornell Tech to do it. Um, and as a question to the community, how can we better support kind of development of these type of models? I think it's gonna be really important in lots of different areas, particularly as we 
kind of contend as computer security, the computer security community contends with you know various forms of abuse online uh, and are against you know particular targeted marginalized or at risk uh, communities. Okay, so with that, I'll just uh, wrap up saying you know we've done a lot of work in this space. It's been quite a quite a journey uh, for the last five years and and it's been very rewarding. And I hope uh, you know you you can go and see more information on our research web page or on uh, CETA, uh, as web page. And I'm happy to take any uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. That's a really insightful talk. I think it's a complicated topic and one that we really need to be discussing more. Um, so we've got some questions have started coming in here on the Slack. So I'll, I'll we'll go through as many as we as we can. Um, so one that I have here is my understanding is that the most dangerous moment for someone is when they leave their abuser. And so I imagine this is also true. Um, for the moment, the user might realize that the victim has changed their passwords to take uh, the accounts out of reach. Yeah. And so do you have any insight on how uh, we might be able to help with that moment? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't have time to, to touch on that. So, so thanks for asking the question, whoever nameless question person is. Um, I'll go look at this slide later. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's a really important point. Um, and this is one of the issues that we you know, learn very early on talking to professionals uh, is about this threat of escalation, right? Uh, and the reason it's such a big threat is it's well understood that, you know, because a lot of what's driving abusers is this, they want to have the sense of control over, over the, their victim. And so, you know, when you're escaping or when you're otherwise trying to kind of uh, get out from under that control, that can trigger, uh, uh, you know, escalation of the abuse. Um, and so this was critical, like in our safety procedures for our interventional models, this was like a paramount kind of concern. Um, we take adopt from straight from the social work literature and practice, you know, doing client uh, centered uh, um, uh, designs, which means that the client's kind of the expert on their situation. And, you know, we don't do things, uh, we, we were basically there to provide advice and information to them about the things they could do if they wanted and they felt it was safe to do so uh, in terms of changing their passwords, these types of things. So concretely, like we actually spend a lot of time warning clients about these types of things, right? So when we say like, oh, you know, you could, you know, it looks like your, abuse, your ex has access to your account. If you change that, that'll be possibly visible to them. And do you need to do some safety planning with your uh, case manager about it? So yeah, it's a, it's a super critical concern. I'm sure we could improve even more, but uh, it's, it's definitely a front of mind. Interesting. Um, so we have another question here. Um, can you say more about your findings of stock aware as a cottage industry? And do you have a sense who's behind this? And are there a number of small time hobbyists or are there large scale outfits that are responsible? Yeah, great. I, so I have a lot more to say on that. And there's, there's definitely details in the papers. Um, I think there's a range. There's some kind of hobbyist one-off developers who kind of slap together some poorly functioning code. There's even just stuff that scam, outright scams, right? And there's some app that doesn't actually work the way it's advertised on the Play Store. Uh, and then all the way up to like, you know, companies like uh, MSpy or FlexiSpy, which have been around for like a decade, 15 years or something, and are pretty big operations with lots of customers. Um, and, and they make money, right? So I think they're making money off of it. There was a big shift, you know, 10 years ago-ish. Uh, the FTC did a, uh, basically, you know, went after one of these companies that was advertising for intimate partner abuse use cases. And so the bigger players like Flex Finance Buy have changed uh, their marketing to family safety, like, so you shouldn't use this for installing on your child's uh, phone or in employee monitoring. Um, we did some discussion, you know, so there's, so it's a bit gray, you know, they still actually promote uh, implicitly the, this uh, intimate partner violence, uh, but it's a little bit gone a little bit underground. Uh, and we did some work in that 2018 paper at Oakland, um, contacting some of the customer support for uh, spyware abuse and asking about abuse situations. They it largely were gung-ho about using their tools for that, that type of thing. So I think it was a real opportunity to kind of try to take, take uh, you know, deconstruct this, the economics underpinning uh, uh, spyware abuse, um, and this, but it's a big topic, yeah. It sounds like there's a lot, a lot to unpack there. Yeah. 
definitely happy to talk about it offline. <laughs> Um, what advice do you have for students who might be struggling to walk the line between um, advocacy and, re and research, given the challenge in the research community that you're just discussing? Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. Um, I mean, it's a tension, right? Like, just to make it concrete, you know, we have a number of PhD students who are doing research in the space, but also volunteer with CETA. And it's something we talk about a lot of like, you know, you're kind of implicitly or explicitly being pressured, you know, to do advocacy or um, or research or vice versa. You know, so you don't want to be exploitative of, of, of volunteers. Um, and we try to build in kind of mechanisms to, you know, make sure it's clear that it's, you know, up to the, the students in that case. Um, more broadly, there's always this question of like, yeah, if I'm spending time like texting back and forth with the clients about their about helping them change their password or like trying to get them not to be afraid of various warning messages that they think might be indicative of hacking you know that's time not spent on the next soups submission right um and i think you know that that's where i think the community should be a little bit more making space for uh realizing that this type of work takes a lot of uh a lot of time um I think some things at the systematic level, I'll just say, you know, in the near term, uh, I think it's actually the work you end up doing is, is better, right? Like I, I'm constantly learning things from clients uh, and it changes my thinking in kind of fundamental ways about the research we're doing and, and comes up with new research topic ideas. So while it's, you know, a bit of a time investment, I think it's, it's well worth uh, the investment uh, if, if you can do it because the work becomes deeper, I think. Um, some of the testing tools that kids are assigned to use for remote testing while doing school from homework um, could be dual use in the same way as stock aware. And do these things get classified in the same way in the app stores? And so how do you define the sort of draw the line between good and bad? Yeah, you really can't. Uh, good and bad. It's very hard. It's very gray. Like, you know, the, the, the statistics about like 3000 app that included all sorts of otherwise totally innocuous things like, you know, Dropbox knockoffs or like SMS forwarding uh, tools or whatever. And actually there was this whole, you know, thing, this whole, it was very frequent during research meetings while we were doing that project that uh, PhD students would come like, oh, you know, here's this app, it's doing like, you know, it's like a file sharing app. And I'd be like, this, why are we talking about this in context of intimate partner surveillance? I don't understand. And then the student would like point at a forum post somewhere saying, like, oh, here's how you set this up to like, you know, exfiltrate information from your uh, significant other. So, uh, so too with these like any monitoring, you know, remote access uh, tools like TeamViewer uh, definitely are like totally legitimate tools. It's like, as far as I can tell, the company is totally reasonable and, you know, they're trying to help with IT support, but, you know, people can use it uh, for ill. So I think we need to understand how to tailor response. You know, there's like the egregious stock where people who are just advertising directly to abusers. Uh, there's tool and, and they actually try to make things covert and stuff, which I think there are some, you know, features that we can say, oh, that's a bad feature and you shouldn't include that. And of course, there's bad intent. And then there's the types of uh, tooling that we just need to be aware of that in IPV situations, like you need to be aware of this tooling. Um, and, but uh, hopefully, companies have made it so that, you know, it's easy to spot this stuff and, and help help them uninstall it or if that's what they decide to do, et cetera. So yeah, you need a range of, of, of approaches. In, so this is just adding on to this, but in your experience, have most companies been sort of open to going, oh, we didn't realize this, you know, could be used in this way, you know, how do we fix it? Yeah, so we do, we spent, well, pre-COVID, spent a lot of time traveling to companies and like talking to them. And yeah, I think a lot, yeah, I think, IPV threat models just weren't on the radar in general, right? That, you know, um, uh, so often would have, you know, Android engineers or whatever come and say, oh, I'd never thought about this, you know, thank you for sharing. Um, and so I think in general, when you, once you surface this kind of, what I refer to as like an invisible threat model, right? You know, I think even at the scale of Google, they, the security team's attention tends to revert to kind of the mean threat model, right? Which is typically commercially motivated, uh, you know, uh, security stuff. And so these things aren't on the radar. Once they are, that's good. Now there are bad actors in the space, just like anywhere else, there's criminals or what should be criminals if it's not criminalized, um, who are basically, you know, uh, making money off uh, abuse. And that we need kind of legal uh, policy kind of stuff uh, to deal with and 
treat them as the bad actors they are. For the other companies, I think it's informing and clarifying. And then really the hard work, I think, on user interface design. I'm not an HCI person by training. And so to me, it's like, uh, it's just, there's a lot of fascinating problems. Like how do you, you know, can you build some of these features in ways that are, promote the good use cases and add friction to these use cases? It's a fascinating set of questions. I think we'll need lots of research on. Um, I've got a question here about, could you comment on helping victims who later return to their abuser and who take multiple tries to leave for good? Um, yeah, I think up. that the, that's a very standard uh, thing. I think the the research that it's like the average number of escape attempts is like nine or something or seven or nine. It's a lot. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think there, there used to be this very paternalistic view, I think, in in the you know the support community. That's like, oh, this is why is the victim doing this? They keep like you know going back. That why are they being like that? Um, and nowadays, the view is to be much more client centered or try to be more client centered. It's like, look, the, you know, people have complicated lives, right? And uh, there's lots of reasons why they may decide to stay with their abuser or go back, um, uh, whether it be because of financial support or immigration status or you know, they, you know, they love the abuser and, and they keep thinking that the abuser is going to change, uh, et cetera. So I think, I think this type of stuff comes up in the technology sphere too. And, and when we talk to clients, like it's very complicated to figure out what's going on with their technological footprint, right? Like just think about all the devices you have and then think about all of those as, and like your children's devices, if you have children with the abuser uh, and all of your accounts, like it's, it's one of the big challenges actually is keeping straight like what accounts are there, when did the abuser potentially have access to the devices or the accounts, when did they not, and so those are some of the key challenges there. Um, yeah, so, so it definitely, it, it comes up uh, a bit in these uh, cases. Most of the time when we're working with clients, they, we always work with clients who go to the FJCs. Many of them have already left the abuser. It, it, it's pretty, uh, pretty mature far along because of where we're sitting in the support ecosystem. Um, and uh, so, but some are still living with their visa, yeah, or some may go back, yeah. I should say we've only just started doing kind of longitudinal support, you know, before it was always a one-off model where we would meet with the client for like an hour and a half, try to help them as best we could, and then they could schedule another meeting, uh, request another meeting later. And now we're doing like longer term support where we kind of have the contact information for the client and actually, you know, talk to them many times. Um, so some of the stuff is still like, we're still learning, you know, the longitudinal effects, uh, longitudinal issues that come up. Um, so the next question here is, um, so I suspect that abusive tech is often a symptom of an uh, underlying abusive social relationship. And so if you mitigate the tech abuse, um, how does that affect the social relationships? So are you potentially putting the victim at more risk, for example? Uh, I mean, potentially, yeah. If, if you kind of have a, a heavy-handed intervention, uh, that could cause problems for a client. Um, and as I mentioned before, on the escalation front, it's something we, we consider. Um, and uh, all the clients we work with have it's kind of critical that we're embedded in the FJC system because they have a case manager who can do safety planning with them. And so a lot of the discussions are be like, oh, it looks like the account's compromised. That's, you know, maybe we shouldn't change anything. We should have, you should talk to your case manager. We can provide some information and you all can safety plan around it. Um, so that, that comes up a lot. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think harm reduction in general here is very hard, right? People have very complicated situations and we're constantly thinking about how to, uh, uh, sorry. Um, how to uh, try to reduce potential harm as much as possible. And another question here, I know you said you, you try not to expand too much into other groups, other populations, but do you have any lesson learned, lessons learned that you think would apply to other vulnerable groups? Yeah, I think there's, yeah, I think there's like at the level of um, methodological approach and then at the level of like, actual insights in terms of like new nuanced threat models. I mean, we, we constantly are talking about how these kind of persistent intimate attacker model, there's probably, there are a lot of nearby uh, kind of settings, right? Like I think uh, uh, trafficking uh, victims uh, is often something that we talk about. Um, you know, the, the models that I think have been on the radar of the security community a bit like our settings like journalists being targeted by governments there's both similarities and differences, right? Like one similarity in the sense these are average people who are getting abused technologically, right? Uh, and need help and probably having tailored kind of socio-technical solutions to helping them would be good. 
Um, and I know some people are thinking about those things. It's also, you have a persistent adversary that kind of like has the resources to get to know that person, but you know, they also have, if it's nation state level, then much different kind of technical capabilities. So some of our intervention models maybe wouldn't align well there. So yeah, I think there's a lot of, of these, I think online, you know, online abuse and just like harassment of people uh, has similar feel sometimes, um, you know, Gamergate and these kind of cyberbullying or sexual harassment kind of online or gendered harassment online. Um, but I do think, yeah, you, you really do, do need to understand a bit about the, a lot about the context of the particular population that you're working with um, to, like, I just, I don't feel comfortable like diving into other areas unless we spend some time, talk to people who have been experts in that area and, um, you know, build up incrementally. So we haven't had any energy to try to shift to another whole area and be like running a whole new research program. Yeah, yeah. makes complete sense. Uh, so this one is asking about financial abuse mm -hmm. and um, how much are companies doing to try to monitor or track that kind of stuff uh, and stop um, possible abuses on their platforms? Yeah, that's a great question. We haven't dug a ton into the financial. So financial abuse is definitely one of the many levers that abusers exploit, and we, we hear about it. We, it we touch on it during our consultations sometimes because people ask about their online accounts for online banking, these kinds of things. Um, I suspect like with social media and these other types of online abuse things, it, it, it's hard, right? Because the it's not clear to the bank who the owner of the account is potentially, right? Uh, I mean, there, of course, legally there's an owner of the account, right? But like who's actually using the interface at that time if you have the right access credentials is, is unclear. These are also often, it's not, you know, like in the, in the online harassment kind of thing, like most of our mitigations are kind of anti-bot basically, right? Like we tried to distinguish between kind of automated scripting behavior because that's what commercially motivated attackers use to like send spam or uh, do, you know, harass lots of people. And that doesn't work very well for one off, you know, it's a person who is sitting down at a computer and like causing problems, right? And I think I would expect the similar problems in the financial sector, but there's a lot of, yeah, we, we haven't done a deep dive on that at all. It would be really interesting to see uh, what you can do there. Um, do you do you frequently learn of abusers who are just threatening or claiming that they're doing the spying, um, but nothing is actually happening? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, we, I mean, we don't. We very. I mean, there's this gen. The you know most almost all the clients we see are are uh, identified as women, um, and there's definitely this gendered thing that goes on too. Like, you know, oh, most dudes are just by default considered better at uh, technology, right? And that comes up a lot. And then I think abusers also lean into that sometimes and say like, oh yeah, I, I'm gonna control everything, you know, you're, uh, because it's an effective an effective threat. Um, relatedly, we, we often also, we so we get a lot of clients who are like very concerned that their everything's compromised and um, are actually quite uh, hypervigilant, which is the, the term from, um, uh, psychiatry for like, oh, you're kind of very uh, alert to potential threats, right? So every time they see some user interface uh, thing that like is not quite working right, they think, oh, this is a sign that the device is compromised. And, you know, this is, from my understanding, this is, this is a trauma uh, response, right? Hypervigilance is a trauma response. And so people are hypervigilant because that, you know, it's well documented uh, way you, uh, uh, repercussion of trauma. Um, and so, yeah, trying to navigate that tension because one, you don't want to disbelieve the client and say like, oh, that doesn't sound plausible or like whatever, you know, it's very easy to be very, um, to have bad knee jerk responses. Like, oh, that's, that's a crazy idea, right? It would be a horrible thing to say to a client. Uh, but at the same time, reassuring them that like, it seems it's very unlikely that this is, you know, this slow, you know, it's not, it's not a typical uh, uh, evident symptom of like malware or something, you know, whatever they're concerned about. So. Yeah, there's a lot of dynamics there. I'd say in, in probably, at least in the cases I've been working on for the last few months, I'd say most often we don't find any evidence uh, right of, of actual like, oh, that looks like a problem, right? Partly it's doing it remote, it's very limited in terms of what we can, how we can investigate. Um, but, you know, partly it's just like once they've reset their phone, like any evidence of potential compromise is gone anyway. So, and that happens frequently. So yeah, right. a lot there. Um, do you have any thoughts about 
the role of banning or deplatforming um, as a way of basically stopping the spread of information about how to do this kind of spying on your partner? Yeah, so you know, Google basically started regexing out like, some of these searches, like track your girlfriend. They tightened their Play Store policies. They also took down some stuff from YouTube. Um, I think, you know, I think so. I think it is an effective lever because it's de definitely targeting some of the monetization uh, effects. Um, it'll be interesting to see how people adapt, right? Whether they either go off platform, like with other kind of deep platforming, that one of the issues is like, oh, they'll just go to other platforms that are less vigilant. Uh, and then even before that, like, you know, wh where is the boundary line, right? Like, Life 360 is, you know, a company that does like child safety monitoring stuff. It's very widely used, right? Um, and it also gets abused. Uh, so should they, you know, where do you draw the line on these things is, is hard to say. So I think deplatforming is, is definitely critical. And I think like tech companies can play a more active role, like having paying people to think about this right in their in their companies, like how to deal with this, you know, I, you know, Facebook like hired a head of women's safety recently. Um, and the people I've talked to and worked with at Google are, are very uh, keen on making improvements, but yeah, there's a, a lot of work to do there. Uh, we've got a question here about considering the main, many forms of labor, um, like technical, emotional, as well as the resources, do you think that the advocate science model is currently sustainable long term? And what do you think would contribute to its sustainability? Yeah, it's a it's a great uh, a great question. Um, I think it'll be. It, I mean, I think they're sustainable in terms of like, yeah, you'll have kind of one off groups that are fired up about doing this type of work. Uh, but whether it becomes kind of um, scalable in terms of like, oh, we'll have a you know community of people who kind of like do these types of uh, direct advocacy plus you know work. I mean, I think we do have some one-offs in a variety of places already, but it hasn't really been kind of formalized. It's like, oh, here's a way of doing research in, in academia. You, you double as an advocate. Um, I think, you know, like other things, we need to make space for that if we want it to be kind of something that's a, a reasonable career path for uh, the average, I don't want to say average because everyone we're working with in these communities is like yeah, a, a high performer, right? But like for the average researcher, like, how do we kind of make incentive structures align so that this type of work um, makes sense to put in that emotional and other type of labor? Um, so I think that's a that's a hard question. I think we just need to reflect on it as a community. I think you know having support from funding agencies, you know having recognition that like you know just being aware that this type of work can be done. I think um, and and recognizing it is good. Um, yeah. All right. So we are one minute left in the session. So maybe we'll wrap up here for the live portion, uh, but there's still lots of conversation happening on Slack. So if you've got some time uh, to interact, that would be fantastic. Um, this has been a really nice session, um, you know, heavy topic, but crucially important. So thank you very much for bringing it um, yeah, to our thank attention. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Lots of great questions. I'll jump on Slack. Uh, thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much.